Hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Kristen and I'm here to talk to you about birth today. I've been away for a little while as I just started graduate school in the fall, which has been crazy. Three children, graduate school, 36 years old, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I don't know what I was thinking. I just know it was a really good decision, but I'm not here to talk about graduate school today. I only wanted to let you know why I was away for a bit. As I said, I have three children and I have three very different birth stories. In this video, I'm gonna talk about my first birth story, which was an emergency C-section. If you've experienced an emergency C-section before and that is triggering for you, I invite you to check out my video about my VBAC, which is a vaginal birth after cesarean, which I'll link above, or my third birth story, a spontaneous vaginal and unmedicated delivery, which I will also link above, and I'll see you there. For those of you sticking around, Either you've had a C-section before, you have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or you're pregnant now and you have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I hope I give you as much information as you can possibly absorb. Hopefully I don't frighten you. My intent is to inform and empower you only. To give you a little background on that particular pregnancy, I had been working with one specific hospital up until I was about 35 weeks pregnant. Myself and my ex-husband moved in with my mother when I was 35 weeks pregnant. We were working with a different hospital for the last few weeks of my pregnancy, but my plan was to get to the original hospital when I was in labor in order to have my child with the hospital I was more familiar with and honestly more comfortable with. The hospital that I wound up having my first child at, we'll just say they have a bad reputation. I was pretty adamant about not wanting to have my child there because of their reputation. I was 39 weeks pregnant when my water broke. My labor did not start and it wasn't like you see in the movies where there's this big gush of fluid. I had more like a trickle. I didn't really think much of it. I thought, well, maybe I'm just having more pregnancy discharge. It's the end of my pregnancy. Maybe I'm just having a lot. I went about my day. I kept making my dinner. I was cleaning. I was taking care of business. I had better things to do than be in labor. Technically wasn't in labor. So I really didn't think much of it until I started leaking through a couple pads per hour. So I called the less desirable hospital and I asked them, you know, should I come in and get checked to see if it's amniotic fluid? And they said, yeah, come on down, we'll check it. Um, but you're only 39 weeks, you're not at your due date yet. So we'll just check it and no big deal. So I thought, okay, well, even if it is amniotic fluid, I mean, I'll still have time to get down to the other hospital. Well, that's not what happened. I went to the hospital, they checked the fluid, and in fact, it was amniotic fluid. And they looked at me and they said, you're not going anywhere. Whoa. I wish at the time I knew I had a choice. I thought, okay, well, it must be really dangerous to leave when my water's broken. At that point, by the time I had actually gotten to the hospital, it had been about 12 hours since my water started leaking out. Technically, with the state of my uterus and my son being heads down for almost two months and my health was otherwise, as far as I knew, I had not been diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or anything else at, the, at that time. Um, as far as I knew, I was healthy. I probably could have gotten away with waiting another 12 hours or so. I asked them, okay, well, can I walk around the labor and delivery unit and try to get my labor started on my own? And they said, sure but we have to put the IV in first. Okay, <laughs> I guess it's pretty common with people with Ehlers-Danlos to have veins that collapse. I didn't know that at the time, I just knew that every time they tried to place an IV, it was horrible. And I couldn't really explain that to them because I didn't know, I didn't have a name for it. I just knew I had bad veins. I asked them if they could use a smaller needle. That didn't work. They started on my hand, which was horrible. It was horribly, horribly painful. I had a bruise on my hand for like six months after my baby was born. Then they tried the forearm, they tried inside my elbow. Those three spots didn't work. Ultimately, they wound up getting me right here in this artery, which I still have a scar from. But it took four different people and two hours, which 
bled into the window of time where they were talking about introducing Pitocin. For those of you that don't know what Pitocin is, it is synthetic oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone that the body produces in labor. It helps with the process of the thinning and opening of the cervix, which is called effacement and dilation. Effacement is the thinning, dilation is the opening of the cervix. And so you need oxytocin. So because my water broke and my labor hadn't started, they were hoping that they could induce contractions with Pitocin. I didn't know much about Pitocin other than I heard it was bad, that it could be dangerous or make labor harder, but I didn't really know why. So herein lies the informing myself that I didn't do. I wanted an unmedicated and natural birth, but I wound up getting all of the interventions that I didn't want. And that none of this, again, is to scare you. It's just to say, in hindsight, I wish I had been better informed. So they said once they started the Pitocin, they would do it on the lowest dose. Once my labor started on its own and the contractions were going strong, they would stop the Pitocin, which was given through my IV. They could up the dose in small increments until my labor got going. Well, that was the agreement. I was fine with it. I said, okay, well, if my labor's not gonna start on its own, um, after the two hours of them trying to place the IV, finally placing the IV, and they let me walk for about an hour. So they extended the time frame. When I tried sitting on the birth ball, doing laps around the labor and delivery unit, I tried dancing, I tried movements. Um, Nothing really got it going on its own. So ultimately they did start Pitocin. In incongruence with my agreement with the OB, my nurse was the one managing the Pitocin drip. And she had put two monitors on my abdomen. One was to measure the baby's heart rate, one was to measure my contractions. Unfortunately, she placed the second one that was measuring my contractions in a bad spot and so she wasn't seeing me contracting. She kept increasing Pitocin every half hour, hour, to the point where my contractions became unbearably painful. They were so intense. I was just being pummeled with them. And they were horrific and they were overlapping and that is not how labor usually works. Typically, there's breaks between contractions where you can kind of sit back and breathe and say, Ooh, that was hard. Let's get ready for the next one. I didn't have any of those breaks. It got to the point where I was just in so much pain that I needed something to take the edge off. Now, I was terrified of getting an epidural, so I asked for an alternative. They gave me Stadol, which is an IV medication they had said was gonna feel like a little bit of a wine buzz. Not the case for me. Unfortunately, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I felt loopy. I felt completely out of control of my breathing. Like I could no longer focus on breathing through the contractions. And it got to the point where all I could do was cry. The pain didn't go away. I just felt really out of control at this point. So it was like, it didn't even touch the pain. It just made me feel super out of my own brain and out of control of my body, which in labor, you're really out of control of your body anyway. So this feeling was really frightening for me. I, I thought, I can't handle this. I cannot take another contraction. It's too much. I finally conceded to getting an epidural which was really hard because I had to stay still through it. Um, there's a very thin membrane that they have to put the medication in. The first needle is to numb you, and the second needle is to administer the anesthesia in that small cavity. So you have to be very, very still when they do it, which is really hard when you're having a very bad contraction. But we managed to do it. So I was numb from the waist down. They started to notice that my son's heart rate was dropping. They call it decelerations, and they were concerned. They came to the conclusion that the external monitor wasn't enough and they needed to use an internal monitor. When they did that, my son, who had been heads down for two months, completely turned sideways. Then all hell broke loose. It was a nightmare. It was like I was living my biggest fear I didn't even know I had. 
So at that point, as I said, I was numb from the waist down, so I couldn't move. The OB came in, who I hadn't seen since the beginning of my labor, like actually before my labor really even started. He came in and he tried to do a version, which is where they try to move the baby into the right position. He tried an external version where he was manipulating my abdomen and trying to kind of like force the baby into the right position. Then he tried to do an internal and external version where he had fingers in my vagina and a palm on the outside pushing down on the top of my uterus. So like trying from both sides, neither worked. It was a bad situation. My baby was completely sideways. His heart rate was dropping. I knew that much. Then I noticed more people come into my room. There was the nurse that was working with me, the OB, the midwife that I had worked with briefly during my pregnancy, the anesthesiologist, and then four more nurses and other staff members were in my room at this point, flipping my body around because I couldn't move myself. Nothing was working. Then at one point they had me on my hands and knees and my hospital gown fell off. So I was completely naked in a room full of strangers, not knowing if my baby was dead or alive, um, freaking out because I didn't know what was going to happen next. And so I was crying very upset at this point um, and I was having a, a bit of a panic attack. They put me on my back on a stretcher and the midwife and the OB looked at each other and they said, we're going. They didn't look at me. They didn't tell me what was going on. They started putting an oxygen mask on my face and wheeling me out towards the hallway. One nurse, oh my gosh, but bless her. She thought and said out loud, can we at least preserve her dignity? And she put a sheet over my naked body, which I really appreciated before we went out into the hallway with more strangers. So we went down to the operating room, which I was totally unprepared for as well. Um, and they strapped me to this cross looking table with my arms out to the side. That was alarming to me um, and to my ex-husband. We, we both were pretty put off by that. It was frightening. And, and even like in the hallway on the way to the OR, I kept asking, is my baby alive? Is he going to survive? Like, is he okay? And, and it did feel like I was dying or like my baby might have been dead. It was, it was traumatic. It was terrifying. To not know was the worst possible feeling. And I said to my ex-husband, I said, if it's between me and him, pick him. Do not choose me. And I meant it. I meant those words. And he remembers them to this day. It was very upsetting. I was very afraid. I wish that somebody would have addressed my question and said, we're not sure how baby's doing, but right now the oxygen will help you get oxygen to your baby because you're taking shallow breaths, which is dangerous for the baby. I wish somebody had just said that. It would have taken the time it took me to say that to you on this video. It would have taken like five seconds to say. So we got to the OR and I see this mirrored light, this big circular light. It was probably like a foot wide and it looked just like a big mirror. And I could see my abdomen and my pelvic area in the mirror. And I, I remember thinking like, I don't wanna watch them cut me, but I can't look away. Like, I, I need to know my baby's okay. Fortunately, the light turned on and I couldn't see anymore. I could not see the reflection. Because I was already numb from my epidural, they just cut into me. They put the tarp up so I couldn't see and my baby was born in about 30 seconds. I heard him cry and immediately I started bawling. Like my tears are just streaming down my cheeks. I was very grateful that I could hear him cry. I knew he was alive, I knew he was okay. But then I started crying for a different reason. I was grieving. At the time, I didn't know that that was why. And the anesthesiologist looked at me and he's like, why are you crying? Your baby's fine and you're fine. But the truth was, I was not fine. I was very sad. I felt like I had been robbed. I felt like my whole vision and idea of what birth 
could be, was taken from me. If there was more communication between me and the nurse, maybe surgery could have been avoided. If she had listened to me, if I had been able to get my labor started at home and gone to the other hospital instead, if I had had the confidence to say no, if I had had the information and the education that I have now, of course, hindsight is 2020. but like looking back, if I had had this knowledge, surgery could have been avoided. And I know that my body is capable of having normal birth because I did it twice after that. So I know that my body knows what it's doing. That birth led me down the path of birth work. At first, I wanted to become a midwife. I wanted to help other families avoid unwanted C-sections. The World Health Organization classifies any rate of cesarean section over 10% as overuse. And in this country, we have about a 33% C-section rate, which is three times the rate that it should be. And I'm talking about elective C-sections that are too early, about emergency C-sections that could have been avoided that have occurred as a result of the cascade of interventions, which is what they call it in birth work, which is when you get one intervention that leads to another that leads to another and usually ends up in surgery. What I want to do here is inform my viewers of what their options are, how they can avoid surgery potentially. I'm hoping to help arm you with the information that you need. So getting back to me going into birth work, I had interviewed for a spot in midwifery school and fortunately they declined me at the time. So after my first child was born and before my second child was born, I was still pretty jaded by my experience and I had a question during my interview about hospital transfer. And I think that they could sense that I was a little jaded and that I might not have made the safest choice if I were attending a home birth and had to have a hospital transfer. Like, would I be comfortable with that? And what would the protocol be? And I wasn't really comfortable answering that question in the way that was appropriate. And they had suggested that I further my education in the birth field and do some doula work with families. Well, in case you're not familiar, a birth doula is a support person that goes with a laboring and birthing individual and their partner, and they provide emotional and physical support to that person and their partner. It's non-clinical. So they wanted me to do it in that capacity first. And so I served some families after, which was amazing. I got to see some babies come into the world. I've worked in the hospital setting. I've worked in home birth setting, which was amazing and empowering. And through those experiences, it provided some healing for me. It helped them, but it helped me as well. It helped me process my experience and also realize that what happened to me could have been different. And that next time I had a baby, it would be different. Once I decided I was gonna do my doula training, I was actually pregnant with my second child. So this is about two years after I had my first child. This pregnancy was unplanned. Um, and I was actually going to be leaving my ex-husband. And so it was quite a shock to find out that I was pregnant the second time. I was still grieving my first experience with birth and so I needed to go through therapy. I did what's called ART therapy which is similar to EMDR. I worked with my therapist at the time who had just done a training in ART which is supposed to be done in one session. It's basically it involves eye movement and reprocessing and reprogramming the brain. What this therapy involves is thinking about yourself in the third person as if you're watching a movie. And so thinking of myself kind of in the third person, and it sounds a little weird maybe out of context, but it really worked. My therapist implored me to think of an experience that I would have rather had, like what my ideal birth experience would have been. Replace the traumatic experience with what I wanted my experience to be. And you know, you're not gonna trick your mind. Your mind knows what happened. The trauma was housed in my body. My mind knows what happened, but 
even being able to share that story with you today, like I never would have been able to do that. And if this was eight years ago, I would not have been able to share that story with you without crying or without anger. I'm able to share that story with you because of the amount of healing and the amount of processing that I was able to do with regards to that experience. So I hope something I've said in this video has been helpful to you. If you are pregnant right now for the first time, congratulations, first of all. Um, if you have hypermobile spectrum disorder, if you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and you're expecting, or you've had a C-section that was emergent, um, that you were unprepared for, uh, my heart goes out to you. I think that you're in the right place. You are educating yourself. You're arming yourself with knowledge so you can make informed decisions. And that's huge. You are already putting yourself on the right track to success. And I hope to post more videos in the upcoming weeks. I've already linked a couple talking about my other birth stories. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. It definitely helps out my channel and I am building my YouTube channel as we speak. You liking and sharing my videos and subscribing to my channel and commenting below with your experience. Did you have a C-section? Are you pregnant right now? Please do yourself a favor and get yourself a provider that is competent and aware of Ehlers-Danlos or connective tissue disorders. And if you can't do that because you live in a more remote area and you're able to get a doula, a lot of states are covering birth doula support and you can inform your birth doula of your disorder. You can count on a birth doula who knows the pros and cons of what's being offered to you. She or he can look at your information and can inform the medical providers. Maybe you have a trauma in your history that is sexual or physical. And those are all things that your doula can help you advocate for and your partner can advocate for you. If you are in a position where your insurance won't cover a, a doula to help you, um, your partner can advocate for you as well. All of this involves open communication and trauma-informed providers and having providers that are familiar with your disorder, whether they already worked with somebody or whether you tell them exactly what issues you have. If you've tuned in and you're with me still, thank you so much for watching. I hope something I said was helpful to you and don't forget to like and subscribe and share this video with the people that you care about. And I'll see you in the next video.